quite frankly, we have a shortage of doctors in North America that can treat Parkinson's disease. As I learn from patients that see me, there is often a several month wait for somebody with newly diagnosed or newly recognized Parkinson's symptoms to get an appointment with a neurologist. Hello, permit me to introduce myself. I am uh, Eric Alskog, Mayo Clinic Department of Neurology, and uh, I am here going to talk about this paper that is being published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Common Myths and Misconceptions that Sidetrack Parkinson's Disease Treatment to the Detriment of Patients. And uh, this is something that I have thought is a very timely kind of um, monograph to, to discuss an issue that I, is near and dear to my heart. I have long argued that Parkinson's disease should be managed at least initially by primary care clinicians and that is something that is very doable. Unfortunately, we've made it so complex, we being the uh, intelligentsia of the Parkinson's disease community, we have made it so complex that a lot of primary care physicians just really can't take on, cannot take on that endeavor. Why is it so complex? Well, there are multiple medications, number one. Number two, there are a lot of misconceptions, and that's what the purpose of this paper is, to address the misconceptions and fictions that have surfaced over the course of the last 30 or 40 years uh, that relate to the management of Parkinson's disease. So one of the myths of that's, that I have included in that article is levodopa stops working after a couple of years. I've seen that in print and I've had patients tell me that. Uh, what, what is that all about? Well, it doesn't, after 10, 15 years, it doesn't work as well. It still works. And you don't see people that when they get to be age 75 or 80, they stop taking levodopa. They still need it and they still get a beneficial response, but it's not as complete as it was early on. So there's one fiction that I think we can put aside here. Levodopa only works for two years or a few years. No, it works for many years, but you do have to adjust the dose and you have to optimize the dose. Here's another fiction. Save levodopa for later. It used to be thought 20 years ago, back in the 1980s, 1990s, that dopamine was the cause of Parkinson's disease. And we now know that that's silly because it isn't just dopamine circuits, and some dopamine circuits are spared, and some dopamine circuits, even within the nigrostriatal system, are spared. So this is not a dopamine substrate that causes Parkinson's disease. But that still has lingered on as we've taught residents and young doctors that, well, we should save levodopa, and when you use it, don't use very much. Here's another fiction. Give levodopa with food. Why is that? Well, to prevent nausea. Well, in point of fact, with the carbidopa added to levodopa, carbidopa levodopa, the brand name for that years ago was Cinemet. Cinemet is Latin for cine without emesis, without nausea. Now, in point of fact, if you give levodopa with meals, it doesn't go to where you want it to go, to the brain. And the problem, of course, is, is that that dopamine transporter that transports levodopa to the, across a blood-brain barrier into the brain, that levodopa transporter there, it's an amino acid transporter, uh, is easily saturated with dietary amino acids. So what you need to do is take the levodopa separately from meals. So what are the rules that you can tell your patients to make certain that each dose of levodopa will uh, optimally kick in? Uh, among people that have these wearing off responses, they can tell you exactly how long before a meal they need to take their dose of carbidopa levodopa. And what I have learned is that you got to take it at least one hour before meals. What about after the meals? Well, if you think about it, you eat a meal, you eat a hamburger, you liberate all those hamburger protein-derived amino acids into the bloodstream, and what happens is they're circulating there for a while. Well, how long do they circulate? Well, those same patients have taught me that to guarantee that their dose of levodopa is going to work, it needs to be taken at least two hours after the end of a meal. Other uh, misconception about treating Parkinson's disease. A lot of folks with Parkinson's disease have insomnia, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep. And uh, I can remember reading years ago when I was newly on staff, there was a paper published saying that you don't want to give levodopa close to bedtime because it changes the architecture of sleep. 
Well, in point of fact, if you have Parkinson's disease and you're in a levodopa untreated state or a levodopa off state, you cannot get comfortable in bed. So what I tell people is early on when you have these around the clock effects, if you take the three doses during the waking day, typically those carry throughout the night and people sleep well. But people that have this wearing off of the levodopa effect, quite often what happens is if their last dose is, let's say, before supper time, and then they go to, they go to bed at 10.30 or 11, the levodopa effect is played out, can't get comfortable. So you need, in those folks with the short duration responses, the levodopa needs to be continued right up to bedtime. And in fact, if they wake up at 3 in the morning, levodopa effect is played out, then they need another full dose. Add on TV. 50% of people with Parkinson's disease develop hallucinations. If I'm a Parkinson's disease patient, I'm thinking, man, this is, this is not good news. If I'm a spouse, I'm also thinking this is not good news because my husband or wife are going to start hallucinating. What am I going to do then? Well, in my experience, hallucinations in just pure Parkinson's disease, and I'm not talking about Lewy body dementia, which is a similar but a little bit different disorder, but Parkinson's disease is not frequently associated with hallucinations in my clinic. So when people come to see me and they're hallucinating, the first thing I do is I look at the medicine. And it's those darn drugs that tend to drive hallucinations. So it's MEOB inhibitors, azelect and salicylene, and it's a dopamine agonist. And the, the, the main drugs that especially drive that would be Pramipexol, which is Mirapex, Repinerol, which is Requip. To a lesser extent, probably the reticotine, which is the uh, new pro patch. So those are the drugs that tend to drive hallucinations. What I do is look at the medication list. If those drugs are on there, we eliminate those one by one and keep an eye on the tolerability of eliminating them. And typically, you can get people off from those and the hallucinations dissipate. If people aren't on any of those drugs, uh, I always uh, check a urinalysis and I worry about any kind of maybe so, you know, subclinical infections because those sometimes knock the wheels off the wagon as well. That brings us to the dopamine agonist drugs, which I have already alluded to, and those would be the, the main competitors with levodopa uh, for treating Parkinson's disease. So the ones that have been in common use over the last, probably since the uh, mid to late 1990s, would be Requip, which is Repinerol, Mirapex, which is Pramipexol. Those drugs are purported to be as close to as efficacious as the levodopa. Well, if you're a physician in the clinic and you're trying to optimize the treatment of Parkinson's disease, they're not even close to as efficacious as levodopa. So you, you can't use those as monotherapy and get people to where you want them. Also interesting with these dopamine agonist drugs, these two particular ones, Pramipexol and Repinerol, they have some very interesting side effects. The most interesting one of which is pathological behaviors that tend to occur in one person in four on therapeutic doses of either Repinerol or Pramipexol. What are those pathological behaviors? Well, probably the most common one would be pathological gambling. Uh, in men, occasionally women, but it's mainly men, pathological sexual kinds of ideation. Pornography addicts doing very inappropriate sexual kinds of things. Uh, anything that is inherently rewarding can be magnified to pathological proportions if you are on a therapeutic dose of Pramipexol or Repinerol. And then finally, they also have the uh, capacity to induce sleepiness. And in fact, the initial papers written about this some 20 years ago described people who are taking Pramipexol or Repinerol getting into car accidents because they were falling asleep at the wheel. So this is, this is not a class of drugs that I like very much, and I actually I prescribed a fair amount of those but I have realized that this is probably not, not something that I want to substitute pretty much ever for carbidopa, levodopa. And uh, finally, there's the issue of what formulation of carbidopa, levodopa to use. And what I've been using to keep things simple is the regular old-fashioned 25-100 media release carbidopa, levodopa. And I thank you very much for listening, and I hope those of you who are enticed to... Uh, uh, consider taking on a larger Parkinson's disease practice. I applaud you, and you're welcome to send me emails, and I'm happy to respond. Thank you again. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. 
Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.